So, hello to everyone, my name is Daniel Martinez, and I am a postdoc at Felipe Cabrera's lab. I would like to thank you for this opportunity to present some of the latest projects we have been working on. So, the lab is focused in the understanding on how microbes and hosts interact in different contexts, as in the presence of drugs. Here I'm going to talk about how we can capture these microbe host drug effects at large scale by exploring the huge diversity within the E. coli species. But first of all, I would like to present one of the main characters of the project, metformin. Metformin is a widely used drug to treat type 2 diabetes worldwide. Its use is so high that we can have, uh, we are able to, to measure it in rivers and other water bodies across many different countries, as you can see in the top right figure, where I have highlighted or uh, they have highlighted the authors, the, the, the countries in which they could measure metformin. Apart from this, it's a very interesting drug as it also shows a bunch of other effects on hosts, like for example an increase of longevity for many animal models. Interestingly, E. coli seems to be significantly increased in patients that are taking metformin as a treatment. As we have previously identified that the effects of this drug are microbe and nutrition independent, we can see that if you feed a metformin resistant strains to C. elegans, as we can see on the top, bottom right part, the original effects of the drug in the warm lifespan disappear. So we have been studying this drug in the lab for a while, and it still keeps a lot of surprises in it. And one of the main questions is, is what I already told, is that it is now accepted that microbes can interact with drugs and modify their effects on the host by a large list of mechanisms that include reducing their bioavailability for the host, change their chemical structure, or for example modifying the efficacy by integrating different signals from the environment. Moreover, this presents a problem as the world population is increasingly more dependent on drugs that need to be taken regularly, as for example the antibiotics, antipsychotics or antidiabetic drugs, as is the case of metformin. So there's much to, to be explored because the large diversity of the microorganisms in our gut can have unexpected behaviors with this treatment, these treatments. And this is a huge problem to solve if we take a look at the massive microbial diversity that we can harbor in our guts. So in a very recent paper, they characterized the potential number of species that might populate our guts, with around 4,500 species. But for me, more, more importantly and especially more striking, is that they found that uh, more than 200,000 non-redundant genomes. This has a profound implication since as within the same species we can find a huge genetic diversity that must be explored if we want to see how these effects act in an actual context. So in this case we might be finding that species uh, can have many many strains in there and those strains can be very different between them as we will see. So this diversity can capture or can be captured by the concept of pangenome, which can be considered as the sum of the strains within one species. So broadly speaking, we can differentiate between two types, the open and closed pangenomes, which mainly differ on their accessory genome size. We work with E. coli pangenome, uh, which has been already very well studied and it is very well known. So and you, as you can see here in the right part of the figure, uh, within the same species we can even stratify them further in different subgroups, which have been defined as phylogroups for E. coli. So as you can see here, we can see that E. coli is composed by many different phylogroups, as is uh, the A, B1, or B2, which are the, the mostly populated, uh, the most populated phylogroups for E. coli. The B2, for example, is especially relevant because it's very uh, related to the pathogenic uh, part of E. coli. Okay, so in order to study these strains on how these strains might affect the host in the context of metformin, we have used the warm C. elegans as a readout. Okay, so this animal is amazing for us and has so many advantages uh, because, for example, you can grow it in a large number rapidly in the lab, uh, there are hundreds of different available mutants that you can use, and it's very easy to create multiple mutants and especially uh, due to its transparency, it allows us to follow fluorescence and also uh, mes uh, we can measure gene expression in vivo. So it's an amazing animal for us and we have been studying and using it for years. So, and we use it not only to understand the biology of the worm, but also as a means to make this kind of complex problems tractable ones. It allows us to use it in a high throughput manner 
testing hundreds or even thousands of conditions with this. Finally, we can use all these findings in order to translate uh, this information in, uh, to other uh, major organisms, like for example Drosophila, uh, Mus musculus, or to humans as well. Okay. So what we want to do is to use this workflow to test the effects of our large E. coli pangenon uh, strains uh, with C. elegans in the context of metformin treatment. So we have approximately 750 strains ready to be used in the lab. This collection of bacteria contains different types of phenotypes, from pathogens to commensal uh, to also lab strains. Importantly, we also have the genome sequence of every strain. Uh, as you can also see on the left part, the strains also have their different uh, origin. Uh, we, also, we have animal uh, commensal, as, uh, we also have human commensals. Uh, and we want to address different questions, as for example, in the context of metformin treatment, is the host response dependent on the strain? Are the effects linked to the differential metformin resistance between bacterial strains? And we have previously shown in the, one of the first slides. And what are the bacterial drivers that are affecting the host response uh, to the drug? So in order to explore this, we're using a worm a strain as a readout that has a GFP protein fused to a promoter of the gene ACS2. This gene ACS2 is related to the fatty acid metabolism in the worm and responds to metformin presence by increasing its expression, as you can see in these pictures. So metformin uh, causes um, an increase in the ACS2 expression and therefore we have a uh, larger brightness. So as you can see on the left part we have a control condition or zero millimolar metformin where you can barely see the worms. But on the right side in 50 millimolar or the treatment condition you can very easily see the worms. Okay. So using this readout we can start testing with worms and with E. coli strains. Okay. So as you can see here in the left part of the graph in control conditions, we barely have any brightness. So you can check also the picture at the zero millimolar uh, metformin column when you can barely see the worms. I have highlighted them uh, for your convenience so you can follow where they are. But they are very difficult to see. However, in the presence of metformin, the effects are quite different between the strains. You can see that some of the strains are very bright, as I saw. I uh, already saw in the previous slide, but we also have an example in which the effect of metformin is not really that strong. And uh, you can also check that up in the pictures on the right side of the of the slide. Okay, so to measure this data at large scale, we have developed a semi-automated pipeline that allows us to explore this complex landscape of phenotypes in a robust manner. So we start from plate preparation to bacterial seeding and also to worm seeding. Uh, we have also created an automated pipeline to both uh, take the imaging and also the data quantification. We have also been creating all the bioinformatic tools in the lab in order to gather or, or to uh, explore this complexity. Okay. Uh, here you have some examples of the results that we have obtained from worm phenotype. In this graph, uh, it is represented the worm brightness in control and metformin conditions for only a few strains. But as you can see here, this confirms our previous results where we saw that different strains had a different effect on the host. As you can see here, the first example is the OP50, which is a largely used uh, E. coli strain in, the, in, in labs, uh, which its effect is very different, for example, for the MG1655, which is in the fourth position, which is also another widely used uh, E. coli strain. So, We can confirm, so we can calculate the, the the fall change between them and use it as a proxy for the for the activity in the worm uh, given the, the bacterial strain, and we can plot them together. So as you can see here, we have a very strong strain-specific behavior. It's quite remarkable that we have so much variability contained within only one species. We range from a very large uh, effect uh, on the host to almost not effect at all. Which is, which is very, very interesting for us. Furthermore, we can also measure bacterial growth at different metformin concentrations. So what we expect is that bacterial growth is reduced with increasing drug concentration, as you can see in this cartoon. So we expect that with zero metformin, zero millimolar metformin or control conditions, we have a certain bacterial growth, but that bacterial growth is decreased when you add more and more uh, metformin to the media. And we have already shown that and, and, and we see that this effect is, 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 
is well respected across all the strains and we can calculate also a resistance score we can try to also to gather all this information into only one number this resistance score which is going to be bigger or larger if the strain is more resistant to metformin and of course smaller if the strain is is, is more sensitive to the metformin and we can do the same as we did before we can plot them together and we can see that we have the same distribution as we previously as, as we did previously with the, with the one phenotype which is also quite a uh, strong strain specific behavior okay so one of the main questions we, that we had in mind and based on previous research is that metformin resistant strains reduced the effects on the host in the context of the drug and these two phenotypes should be correlated somehow but surprisingly they are not in many cases and we only see a minor negative correlation in the pathogenic strain but an effect that can barely explain all the diversity that we have here so there must be something else so going back to this figure um, we already know that E. coli belongs to the category of open pan genomes okay so we know that it has a very large accessory genome it has a lot of members also uh, so it is natural to think that the differences in the genetics of these strains must drive the effects on the host but first of all let's characterize how diverse is the E. coli pan genome in reality so when you calculate the different gene families present in the pan genome, the numbers are striking. If we consider that an average lab strain contains around 5,500 genes, uh, we can see here that uh, we can almost find we can find almost 28,000 genes in the complete pan genome, which is super huge. Their core pan genome is around 3,000 genes. Okay, so only 3,000 genes remain stable across almost every uh, strain in our cohort. Uh, you can translate these numbers uh, in the right part, in, 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 the, in the graph on the right part, and you can see the gene proportion per number of genomes. And this characteristic use shape is found in many open pan genomes. So this is another proof that we are dealing with an uh, with, uh, open pan genome. So the left tail of the distribution is telling us that the accessory genome is super large, super big. So therefore this is telling us that also that we are dealing with a very complex gen genetic landscape. So indeed, if we characterize the phyla groups in these strains and build a phylogenetic tree using the core genome, we can already see that they fit almost perfectly. Okay, so we have a very well-known and studied population. We have these 700 and something strains. You can build the phylogenetic tree using only the, the, the most stable genes. And also you can uh, capture or you can characterize the filo group uh, using other means. Okay, so you can see that both things, both the, the phylogenetic structure and the filo groups are correlating very, very well between them. Which is also very interesting is that if you use not the core genome, but the accessory genome, so the gene presence absent matrix, and do a PCA plot of that, you can also see that the same uh, genetic structure of the of phylogenetic structure also remains stable for the PCA, which is also quite interesting for us. Okay, so there is a, a, phylogen a phylogen see, phylogenetic relatedness between the, the members of the, of the pan genome. And a very important detail is that when you see the proportion of strains per bacterial phenotype, we see a massive enrichment of lab strains belonging to the phylo group A, as you can see in the middle part of the plot. This is quite interesting and also very, very important because it's telling us that by only studying the lab strains or only using the lab strains, we are leaving a lot of the natural context of E. coli out. And therefore, the findings are limited in the end. So, one of the most important aspects of this pipeline is that it is allowing us to explore what is really happening in natural conditions. Then, with all this information at hand, we can start asking different questions, as we as what are the genetic drivers that are playing an important role in these microbe host drug interactions. And to explore that, we can use a very widely used tool in human genetics, the Genome-Wide Associations, or GWAS, but in the context of microbes. So in this case, at the problem at hand is slightly different uh, as we can try to understand the genetic diversity from different angles. First of all, the phylogenetic structure has a major role in the analysis. So, uh, as you can see here in the middle and the right part of the plot, we need to take into account the uh, phylogenetic structure of it in order to, to do a proper analysis. And also, um, 
we can use the information about the gene uh, about gene presence absence to inform us about what are the genes that might be important for the phenotype okay so this has been previously used in the context of bacterial resistance for antibiotics as you have in the middle part of the plot and we are extending it also to capture the effects on the host okay so we have the microbe drug host GUAS. So together with the use of C. elegans, we can also quickly do experimental validations of the most interesting findings from this analysis. So in order to do that, I'm going to repeat myself, but we can study the accessory genome and then we can try to understand what I just mentioned and how the accessory genome is playing a role in this problem by analyzing the gene presence absence. Once you do that, we can see that there are some genes that might be potential targets of this microbe host drug interaction. The list of genes can be daunting, as we uh, have many potential hits. Uh, in this plot, the color in here also represents the gene frequency in the population, and the y-axis is the, ne the negative log uh, 10 of the p-value, so the larger uh, this value, the, the lower the p-value is in reality. And to try to get some sense of, out of this, we can try to gather these genes and also make enrichment analysis. And we have very interesting uh, aspects that are being popping up from here. For example, the TSA cycle might be playing a role, as we have previously shown that uh, metformin has an important role in, in, in the bacterial module and energy module, but we also have other uh, things that could be interesting for us. In any case, uh, let me finish this presentation by summarizing the findings that we have uh, done in here. Okay, so I would like uh, to say that we have seen that the different strains behave very differently for both bacterial growth and within the host, and that these two phenotypes don't explain each other. So, however, as we are working with a species that has a large genetic diversity, we can ask what the, the genetic drivers of such complex and rich interactions could be. We have seen that there are some metabolic and genetic functions, uh, functional clusters that may be acting in these interactions, and I would like to finish it by saying that this opens new ways in which we can explore these hits in the future by validating these hits experimentally in the lab and also by showing new mechanisms that could play an important role for the microbe host drug in the natural context. I would like to finish this presentation by saying thank, thank you for, um, to Felipe, which is my PI, and also to Jennifer, which is uh, the PhD student, has been doing most, most of the experimental work in here, and also to all the other colleagues in the, in the lab. So. Thank you to all, and if you have any questions, my mail is always open. So, thank you. <laughs>